So Mauricio, thank you so much for uh, for being with uh, with us today. Thank you so much for for your time. It's a, it's a pleasure to have you. Uh, for the audience, uh, could you please briefly introduce yourself? Hello, thank you so much, Sam. It's a pleasure to be speaking to you today. So uh, my name is Mauricio Rodas. Um, I am the former mayor of Quito, Ecuador. I am uh, currently a visiting scholar at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, teaching on cities climate resilient infrastructure financing. Wow. And I am also also um, a senior fellow at the Adrian Arts Rockefeller Foundation Resilience Center, uh, working with cities around the world on how to address um, extreme heat. I am also the co-chair of the um, Global Commission on Biodiverse Cities by 2030, mm -hmm. which is based at the World Economic Forum. And finally, I am part of the uh, Committee of Experts on Public Administration at the United Nations. So keeping myself pretty busy. <laughs> yeah, I can see that. I can see that. I hope you still have time uh, yeah, to, to enjoy and have time for yourself. But it's, it's impressive. It's really uh, humbling to be, to be with you. And, and yeah, if you can start by telling us a little bit more about your yeah, extensive and impressive experience in the world of politics, international organization, mentioned the World Economic Forum, the UN. Um, what are, what, are, what are your major achievements and uh, the major challenges that you had during these years? So let me, let me talk about first, um, you know, let me, let me address the, the political side of yes. the story and Please then, do. And then I'll, I'll, I'll focus on what I'm doing right now. That's fantastic. So basically I started doing politics in 2011. I, um, let me go back a little bit. Yes. I, am a, I am a lawyer, I am a lawyer by training. I studied law in Ecuador, then I um, uh, went to the States uh, to do a double a master's degree in public administration and political science with a Fulbright scholarship. Um, then I lived in Mexico, I worked for ECLAC, which is a UN agency. And uh, I also founded a think tank in Mexico, which worked uh, with several Latin American countries on developing, developing a social and um, sustainable uh, policies. And then I came back to Ecuador uh, to do politics. Uh, and and um, I founded a national political party, which is called SUMA, which is still one of the strong political parties in the country. Mm -hmm. uh, I ran for president in 2013, being the total outsider of the competition. And uh, I didn't win the election, but I did pretty well. Yeah. Uh, and the next year, I ran for mayor of Quito, um, against the incumbent. So it was a really tough uh, competition, but I finally won the election with, a, with an important margin. Uh, and I was the mayor of the capital city of Ecuador between 2014 and 2019. Yeah. During my term, I focused a lot on the climate agenda. Uh, and you know we developed very important projects in that field including the construction of the first metro line in the city and in the country. Um, a metro line that was built in only three years. That's so crazy. It was really, really record-breaking record -breaking in terms of meeting the schedule and also meeting the budget because you know, the, the budget, the original budget was, was respected. And as you know, with huge infrastructure projects like this, it is very difficult to of meet course, the schedule and the budget. But yeah. we managed to do that. that is um, crazy. We also developed some other in, important initiatives on, on sustainable development and climate change. And the other important piece that I would like to mention about my time as mayor is that I was very active internationally. Um, I was the hosting mayor of the UN Conference on Urban yeah. Sustainable Development Habitat 3, uh, where the new urban agenda was uh, approved. And, you know, I was also very active in different city networks, like a C40, ECLE, the Global Parliament of Mayors. I was part of their global boards. I was also two terms working world president of UCLG, which is the United, United Cities and Local Government yeah. Organization. Uh, and, you know, that kind of also paved the way to what I am doing right now, uh, also in the city space at the global scale. That is, that is really impressive. And, 
and um, and yeah, we'll, we'll have um, we'll have time to talk a little bit more about um, about what you did and what you're doing right now. Um, but yeah, I w wanted to ask you the question of support. What kind of support did you get when you wanted to activate all these initiatives? Where you wanted to to have Ecuador play an important part, also at an international level, uh, in terms of commitment to social and environmental challenges. What um, yeah, what kind of support did you get and how challenging were, was it? Well, I mean, uh, of course, we, we got support from, from people who believed in the cause, even though we were just starting. For example, mm -hmm. when we created uh, our national party, I mean, yeah. we were just a group of young people with a lot of ideals, with a very uh, innovative, I would say, political stance, because we were advocating to left behind the traditional divide between left and right, which in my view is totally old fashioned. Uh, and instead we de developed what's called the responsible government model. So basically our proposal was to look at the way government performs, not in terms of left or right, but in terms of whether it is or not responsible, which is yeah. at the end of the day what people And when you mean responsible, what do you mean exactly? At, at, at what levels exactly? So being responsive to people's needs. Being responsible means, you know, to actually uh, fulfill people's uh, desires in terms of what's right for them. Social justice, yeah. sustainable development, yeah. uh, you know, address uh, addressing income inequality, poverty alleviation. Uh, a responsible government is a government that respects human rights, that respects liberties, freedom. Uh, a responsible government is one that respects the constitution, uh, yeah. constitution the legal system, the rule of law. Um, that's, the, that's what we mean by a responsible yeah. government. And all of these things don't have to do either with the left or with the right. They're just responsible. Exactly. It's a common responsibility that we all share, no matter our, our beliefs, no matter our political uh, aspirations. I, I agree with that. I agree with that. And so according to you, what are the major challenges that the world and maybe also Ecuador um, should focus on right now? You mentioned, you mentioned a few, but um, to achieve social and environmental justice, what are, what are key global challenges that we absolutely need to address um, now at a short term and also at, in, in the long term? Well, after being the mayor of Quito, of course, I have a, I have a very clear bias towards cities. Of course, uh, but so I, I still work with cities around the, I still work with cities around the world. And I think that one of the, 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 the main challenges that we have today in the world is of course uh, climate change. For me, the biggest threat that you, humanity faces uh, nowadays. And in order to effectively tackle climate change, we, do to, we need to do a lot of things. But one very important that probably many people are not aware of is to empower cities in an effective way for them to address climate change. Why? Because it is in cities where more than 70% of CO2 emissions are taking place. Yeah. So without cities, it would be impossible for countries to meet, to meet their NDCs and to meet the Paris Agreement. We need cities uh, addressing effectively climate change. Now, for cities to do that, they need to undertake a huge infrastructure transformation to make it climate friendly. And to do that, cities need access to finance. And the problem is that cities currently don't have proper access to the international financial system. Why? Because it was not designed for cities. It was designed for countries. We need to make it more cities friendly. We need, we need to promote significant reforms to the international financial system in order for it to develop new and robust direct financial facilities for cities. What do I mean by direct? The problem that we have right now is that for many cities around the world, it is impossible to access international finance. In many countries, cities are even banned to internationally borrowing. In some other countries like Ecuador and others, um, 
in order for a city to access to international finance, you need a national government guarantee. Yeah. A national government guarantee that may not be granted because of political rivalries between the national government and the local government. Something that I personally experienced as yeah. mayor. Yeah, and you don't have a lot uh, so, of, of power on that. You don't have a lot of control, right? So because of these and many other reasons, cities are not accessing enough capital to develop climate-friendly projects. And therefore, they don't have the capacity to uh, address climate change as needed. And I think this is a fundamental aspect that we need to take into account if we really want to, you know, face this challenge so big, uh, which is climate change in an added great way. Thanks a lot, that, that makes a lot of sense. What do you think about um, a collaboration between the public and the private sector? How important, uh, important is it in, in your eyes? And how exactly did you try to activate that when, um, uh, when you were the, the, the mayor in, in, in Quito? It's fundamental. I mean, the public sector cannot do it alone. It's impossible. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's very, very important to engage the private sector as much as possible. Yeah. Uh, and in order to do that, you need to have uh, an appropriate regulatory framework. For example, I'm I go sorry. back I'm, to I'm my sorry, point for developing I'm climate okay. uh, infrastructure in cities. For example, we want to attract private investment into cities. Um, the problem that many cities and countries are facing around the world today is that uh, they have very complex and difficult to implement regulatory frameworks, for example, for developing public-private partnerships, which are key for developing climate resilient infrastructure. This is just one example of the kind of challenges there are to foster a much more, a much closer collaboration between the private and the public sector. And I think we need to address these yeah. problems. Uh, for example, I've been advocating for developing a comprehensive and very deep benchmark analysis to identify best practices from around the world regarding uh, regulatory frameworks for private investment um, in cities and in countries in general. Uh, I think that's that's just one approach for this yeah. uh, collaboration. But you can you can find a lot of ways to engage uh, the private sector and the community, uh, not only the private sector. I Absolutely. think it's fundamental to build multi-stakeholder partnerships, including, of course, civil society, the academia, uh, social movements, uh, in order, along, of course, with the public and the private sector, in order to, uh, you know, face the, the global most pressing issues. And one example at hand regarding that is what just happened with COVID-19. If you look at uh, success stories uh, uh, regarding, you know, dealing with COVID-19, you will always find that behind those success stories, there was a multi-stakeholder partnership. Of course. That gives us a clear signal of how important uh, following this approach can be. That, that makes a lot of sense to me. And um, I know that you've been quite involved um, in obviously addressing different um, uh, social and environmental challenges. Um, you've used food, or at least you, you've been trying to use food as a tool for social and environmental change. Uh, you, I remember your, um, your speech uh, at the Social Gathering Movement Summit, which I thought was, uh, uh, was great. Now, according to you, could you summarize what are your thoughts on that? How can we use food for social and environmental change? Because right now, we, we waste about one third uh, of the food we produce. It's either wasted or lost. At the same time, there's a lot of people that are hungry that suffer from Food, food insecurity, malnutrition, and, and all the challenges that, that are, around, uh, that are um, related to food. So what are your thoughts on that? And maybe you can uh, talk about it from the lenses, from the perspective of, of Ecuador. Well, I think not only in Ecuador, but everywhere. Everywhere, uh, of know, course. Using food as a mechanism for fostering social equality, sustainable development, uh, 
Uh, sorry, sorry, I'm sorry. It's lagging. Yeah, part. it's it's lagging. It's lagging. Uh, yeah. I hope we can continue. Okay. Um, do you want me to ask you? No, I think I the question you got it right. I will just uh, yeah. let you uh, answer it. Okay, perfect. Okay. I think not only in Ecuador, but all around the world, uh, food can play a key role yeah. in fostering social equality, sustainable uh, development, economic growth, prosperity, uh, the protection of, of ecosystems, uh, and of course, the issue of food security. Yeah. Uh, I think that that's, that's the beauty about the food uh, movement. Uh, and, and the food social movement that has been, uh, you know, pursued uh, a few years ago and that you are part of that along with uh, other great partners. Uh, I think that, that there are a lot of initiatives to look at. Yeah. Uh, and I think that the challenge now is how to expand, how to scale up these very interesting social initiatives regarding food that are being implemented in different regions uh, of the world. I think that uh, one of the things in which um, we should look more into is the connection between the urban and the rural totally and the agree. role that food can play in that regard yeah. uh, for the sake, for example, of food security, but as I said before, also for the sake of addressing climate change, building resilience, uh, empowering women. Uh, here in Quito, well, as, well, I was a mayor, uh, we uh, expanded a very interesting initiative called Agrupar, through which we had uh, urban gardens around the city. And those uh -huh. urban gardens, uh, you know, produced organic food, healthy food. Uh, more than 80% of those gardens were managed by women. So it was also about, you know, empowering women. Uh, it was an issue directly related with uh, poverty alleviation, but also addressing climate change and building resilience. So that's the beauty of food. It can combine a lot of different uh, aspects that can uh, significantly improve people's quality of life and the well-being of the planet. That, that makes a, a lot of sense. Again, I, I agree with that. I think that collaboration is really important, not only between uh, urban and rural, not only within the country, but even uh, between entrepreneurs, politicians, activists, different kind of players. So together we can share knowledge, we can share skills, we can share networks. Um, and yeah, just try to be more open to that. We're talking about SDG 17 right now, which I believe is, is, is one of the, the most important ones. So, so yeah, I, I totally follow you on that. Uh, now, my next question is about concrete examples of what a government could do to accelerate change. What kind of, um, yeah, what kind of, of laws, of bills you could pass um, to accelerate the change? What kind of strategy um, more governments, according to you, should implement to accelerate that change, both social and environmental? But I would say, first of all, to have an open attitude towards innovation. Yeah, innovation, <laughs> which is yeah which is not necessarily easy at the public sector. Usually it's quite the contrary. Yeah, yeah. So I think that the openness to, the openness to, to innovation is absolutely key. Yeah. Um, and then also to empower the community, to empower you know, uh, players from, again, the private sector, social movements, academia, civil society. Uh, I think that, again, the public sector cannot do it alone. Uh, as much as the public sector can take into account ideas, initiatives, proposals coming from these other players, the better. Uh, and also the fact that governments should connect themselves more at the international level. And when I mention governments, I am not only talking about national governments, I also talk about city governments, state governments, all levels of governments, uh, because from international cooperation and collaboration, you can learn things. You can identify best practices. You can cooperate in a much better way. And the reason why I do I say this is because again I have a bias yeah. for what what's what's called city diplomacy and the way this is, has become a growing movement uh, of cities becoming not only local but also now global players uh, participating in the crafting 
of the global agendas. I mean, cities participated in the crafting of the SDGs. Actually, they managed to have SDG 11 after a yeah. big negotiation, as you know. Yeah. Then they participated um, during the, the, you know, the, the crafting of the Paris Agreement. Uh, I had the pleasure, again, of being the hosting mayor of Habitat 3. And uh, we have Crazy. more than 500 mayors and local authorities coming to Quito. And uh, they had a, an active participation in the crafting of the new urban agenda. And we have more examples to mention in this regard. I think much more needs to still needs to be done. I think cities and subnational governments have to play a, a greater role in the global arena of discussions. We have been making progress Again, we need more, uh, but this is an encouraging sign. And I think that um, this is the kind of initiatives that should be promoted as well. How can we empower these other players in the global arena of discussions? Because they have a lot to say. Uh, they have, you know, in the case of local governments, they are the closest to the citizen, to their everyday realities. So of course they should be heard when we discuss you know, these global treaties, these global agendas and the way forward for the world. That's that that makes a lot of sense again. And and I just wanted to ask you um, a follow up question. What were the biggest outcomes of uh, of of the, this global agenda that that uh, you, you had the chance to to host in, in Ecuador? What outcomes did you see um, in other countries? What kind of initiative emerge from this collaboration? If, if you have any stories that, you, that you'd like to share. I have many stories, but yeah. really, <laughs> since you are so much into the SDGs, which I think is great, yeah, yeah. let me tell you something very concrete that yes, came out perfect, of, perfect. Of, Wonderful. Of, of Quito, uh, which is this great movement, the BLRs, the Voluntary Local Reviews for the SDGs. As you know, uh, you know, countries are the ones supposedly uh, you know mandated yeah. to, to to deliver this these reports on how they are making progress on the SDGs but in a voluntary way cities and local governments decided to do the same uh, to present to the UN on a yearly basis a report on how they are doing making progress on the localization of the SDGs and now, uh, there are more than 100 cities around the world who every year present this report, this voluntary local review to the, to the UN on the SDGs. I think that's a very concrete outcome. Absolutely, that is very concrete. Big, and, very and, 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 and it tells you, again, going back to my previous point, the importance of cities as global players, right? Uh, as you know, SDGs are fundamentally local. Yeah. So here Absolutely. you have a, a clear example of a global agenda that needs to be implemented at the local level. Yeah. Uh, because at the end of the day, more than half of the population in the world live in cities. Yeah. So all of these challenges that the SDGs, uh, you know, are aiming to address, should be defined in cities. That's why you know I am so passionately working on no, this. No, that topic. that makes a lot of sense, and maybe you have in mind one or two examples of cities or countries uh, that are leading by example on, on, on these topics. Um, we often mention uh, Sweden or Northern Europe countries. What, what are your thoughts on that? What, what countries or cities are um, really an example that we should uh, look at? Well, uh, let, me, let me mention a couple of examples of cities. Yeah, perfect. Uh, one of them is the city of Freetown in Sierra Leone. Uh, in Africa. Uh, so in spite of having a lot of very big economic social challenges, you know, and by having a very ener energized and dynamic mayor, they are implementing very innovative uh, initiatives from three canopy projects uh, uh, with very interesting community engagement mechanisms to you know, fostering the empowerment of women uh, and vulnerable communities on, on the economy. Uh, we have uh, the example of uh, the city of Buenos Aires in Argentina. Yeah. Uh, you know, it is a city that very early in the process embraced 
the movement of, of the VLRs, the voluntary local reviews for the SDGs, and they have a very clear uh, uh, social and sustainable uh, agenda based on the SDGs. Uh, so these are just a couple of examples of cities that are making the difference for the population. And it doesn't matter how uh, developed or underdeveloped a country may be, a city can implement a lot of innovative action and improve the well-being of their population. Of course, the developing world uh, faces a much more challenging situation. But again, there's still room for yeah. innovation. That's why this word for me is, is so yeah. key. Uh, innovation is absolutely fundamental for this kind of new initiatives. That's that, a really good point. You know, as we can see from different, different international examples, can yield very positive results. That, that makes a lot of sense. We mentioned innovation, we mentioned collaboration, intrinsic motivation of cities and countries to, um, um, to accelerate change. So, so yeah, these are really important topics. And again, I want to, 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 to thank you uh, for sharing your thoughts and insights. I think it, it has been wonderful. I have, I have one last question for you. Um, what advices uh, do you have for, for young people? Uh, and even for, for, for any kind of people, but I, I want to focus mainly on, on young people uh, right now, because many of them want to be part of the change. They want to uh, be actors and, and, and players uh, that will have a big impact and that will contribute to accelerate social and environmental change. But how can they do that? Um, there's many ways, but most of them, most of us were kind of lost. So what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think the world uh, is living very challenging times in many regards. Yeah. Um, from the world in Ukraine to, you know, climate change, uh, you know, a growing migration uh, around the world, the need to build resilience, you know, uh, rising poverty after COVID-19. I mean, that's the kind of big challenges we, we face and we need new ideas and those new ideas most likely will come from young people so i encourage young people first of all to to think big yeah uh, to think big to dream big yeah and to find something that really uh, you feel passionate about and devote yourself to that i think that um, just like we are facing big challenges, the world is also offering new opportunities to address those challenges, new and very exciting opportunities. For example, with all of what technology is coming up with in a very, very fast pace, uh, one that we wouldn't imagine just a few years ago. So my advice, take advantage of those opportunities, follow your dreams, think big, and feel passionate about what you do that's the recipe in my view for success yeah. not only for, for an individual but more importantly for the whole world i i totally agree with that that really resonates with me thank you so much so much for sharing um your your thoughts and your experience today and uh yeah i want to encourage you to do more of, of what you're doing and to continue to have an impact it's uh, it's really uh, it's really impressive so First, congrats, and, and again, thank you for, for sharing your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure, and good luck. It's been a pleasure. Great project. Please, please, go thank ahead with that. That's yes, really we will. We will. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye.